Now I would like to invite Jared up to do the land acknowledgement. Thank you. Jalasi, welcome. My name is Jared Watton, and I am the coordinator of Indigenous Outreach and Research with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. <clears throat> um, I am wearing a red button-down shirt with black pants and have red hair today and a red beard. I would like to acknowledge that Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the sorry, the traditional and ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq Nation. The statement I just read is a land acknowledgement, and I'm going to take a few minutes to give you a deeper understanding of what this is and why we do this protocol. You just heard me in my introduction use the word Jalasi. In English, this means welcome, but in Mi'kmaq, <coughs> it means so much more. It means that we have been waiting for you. You are our honored guest. You can have the warmest spot in our wigwam furthest away from the door and closest to the fire. I like to explain this word out so people understand that it is so much more in our language and traditions than just a single action. You may wonder why it is important to acknowledge the land at the beginning of an event or a gathering. A land acknowledgement marks a small but important step in the process of reconciliation and building positive relationships with Indigenous people. By making a land acknowledgement, you are partaking in an act of reconciliation and honoring the land and Indigenous presence, which dates back over 13,000 years. This is a tradition that's dated back centuries for Indigenous people, for, for many non-Indigenous Canadians, officially recognizing the territory or lands we stand on is a fairly new concept. Historically, a land acknowledgement is a traditional practice shared amongst many Indigenous groups to recognize the land and territory they are visiting. As people, we have existed, <coughs> sorry, as people, we have had extensive trading practices with surrounding communities. So it's greatly important to acknowledge or show our gratitude for visiting other groups areas. Today in a modern context, we do a similar practice. When I enter another community, the first question I am asked is, where am I from and whose son am I? This lets them know who's my, whose clan I belong to, what community I'm from and what family I belong to. We refer to this area as Mi'kma'ki, which covers Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, parts of Quebec, and Maine. In Mi'kma'ki, we have eight districts similar to municipalities with natural territorial markers like, liver, <coughs> sorry, like, riv <coughs> like rivers as their boundary markers. The Halifax Regional Municipality is located in the Mi'kmaq district of Sabaganagadi. Within HRM, there are three reserved lands, Sabaganagadi First Nation, Millbrook First Nation and Acadia First Nation. Today as a Mi'kmaq man, I stand here proud. <clears throat> I was asked to do a territorial welcome and have decided to make it a small teaching about a land acknowledgement. And in closing, I will always say it means more when a settler does a land acknowledgement. We as Indigenous people understand where we are living and where we work on Mi'kmaq lands. Jalasi, thank you. Thanks so much for that, Jared. So today we're gathered here to recognize Access Awareness Week and celebrate the amazing work that has been done in our communities. I now want to invite Sherry Costa Lorenz up. She is chair of the PANS committee and executive director of the Nova Scotia League for Equal Opportunity to speak about Access Awareness Week. Bit of adjustment for height here. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that some of us may be frantically checking our phones in light of uh, current circumstances. And uh, uh, I know that we certainly understand that uh, the mayor was not able to make it today. Uh, again, our hearts and thoughts go out to everybody who is impacted. We also would like to thank 
everyone, our volunteers and firefighters, the community. This speaks to the maritime community of how we come together in times of crisis. We're no strangers to this, and we know that we have support in the community. We also know how hard it is on everyone. I just wanted to acknowledge that. I also want to uh, acknowledge that the Partnership for Access Awareness, better known as PANS, continues to fully embrace the intent and spirit of Rick Hansen's Man in Motion Tour. Each year, beginning the last Sunday of May, <clears throat> pardon me, a little bit of a sore throat here. Each year, beginning the last Sunday of May, Access Awareness Week is an opportunity that allows Nova Scotians to promote these audiences to all walks of life. Through press conferences, forums, concerts, and parades, we are able to engage the broader community on issues that must not be ignored. This year's theme is Access Includes Everyone, moving the bar on quality of life for, and this is where my communications team is going to get upset with me because I'm going to add for persons with disabilities because that is our focus. Barriers to inclusion are as much about attitude as they are about physical structure. Because while changing a municipal bylaw or enforcing the charter may technically remove barriers. It is by fostering attitudes of acceptance and responsibility that the real obstacles are overcome. Access Awareness Week addresses a fundamental step of positive change making. It is meant to set a positive, undaunted tone for the week because raising awareness is something that everyone can contribute to. And speaking of contributions, I'd like to thank the Public Health Leadership Team for their generous donation, recognizing Catherine Hebb for her work with the Public Health Team. Catherine worked for Public Health since 2006. Yes, if you're wondering how I knew. <laughs> Holding various positions, most recently the Director of Public Health in the Western Zone. And yes, she is Mel Hebb's daughter. Catherine has moved into a new role with the Canadian Cancer Society and takes with her a wealth of knowledge and passion for health promotion work. During PANS, we aim to do two things, to celebrate what has happened to increase accessibility and the potential of things to come. Formally, PANS achieves this with the presentation of today's awards, the Melheb Hourglass Awards, which we will witness shortly, and the PANS scholarships, that will happen later this week. Informally, PANS attempts to integrate this attitude into our approach to all things. We also bring issues of access to the attention of the public and the policymakers. And as often as it's been said, change can grow from the bottom up, or it can be implemented from the top down. And we want both to happen, with the movements happening somewhere in between. With this in mind, I would like to close by reminding us all of the impact this current strike is having on children with disabilities, who through no fault of their own have lost the opportunity to be educated, to be with their friends and with peers. And I ask and remind us that we have the collective power to use our voices to urge an end to this strike, because earning a living wage should not be too much to ask for those who are taking care of our most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Next, we have a video that we're gonna play of Justice Minister, the Honorable Brad Johns to recognize Access Awareness Week. The Honorable Brad Johns was first elected to the Nova Scotia House of Assembly as MLA for Sackville Beaver Bank in 2017 and was reelected as MLA Sackville Uniac in 2021. Previously, 
sorry, previously to becoming a member of the legislature, he served as a municipal councillor with HRM, first elected in 2000 and re-elected three consecutive times. He has served on more than 30 boards and commissions, including Destination Halifax, Nova Scotia Trade and Convention Center, Neptune Theatre, Halifax Re Regional Development Association, and the Nova Scotia Library Association. He was the first elected official to act as chair of the HRM RCMP Police Commission and served as deputy mayor for the municipality. Currently, he is chair of the Law Amendments Committee and a member of the Assembly Matters Committee. Minister Johns has been Nova Scotia's Provincial Secretary, Minister of Justice, and Attorney General since 2021. So we'll have a video playing on the screen um, up front. And for those who use ASL, the interpreter will come on about 10 minutes or 10 seconds into the video. Good morning and thank you for the invitation to be part of Nova Scotia's annual celebration, Access Awareness Week. I'm honored to be the minister responsible for the Accessibility Act and to be able to once again reaffirm our government's goal of a more fair and accessible Nova Scotia by 2030. Access Awareness Week celebrates the valuable contributions and leaderships of those Nova Scotians with disabilities and helps to build awareness about how we can all make our province more accessible and inclusive. Nova Scotia has been recognizing and celebrating Access Awareness Week for 36 years, and this year's provincial theme is Access Includes Everyone, Moving the Bar on Quality of Life. Access Awareness Week is a great opportunity for Nova Scotians to join local efforts while working together to prevent and remove barriers for all persons with disabilities. We know people with disability across Nova Scotia experience more financial insecurity more social isolation and higher rates of unstable unemployment compared to those without disabilities. This is not something we want to hear and it's something we're working to change. When all Nova Scotians have access to communities where we live, work and play, it enhances a sense of well-being, belonging and overall quality of life. An accessible province means an inclusive future for all Nova Scotians and the government in Nova Scotia is committed to leading by example. To help move the bar on the quality of life for persons with disabilities, the Department of Justice is supporting the Nova Scotia League of Equal Opportunities to develop a quality of life index. This will be the first tool of its kind in North America and will measure improved accessibilities with a focus on well-being of persons with disabilities in Nova Scotia. All government departments are acting on commitments made to the government of Nova Scotia's accessibility plan. And this means that departments are developing accessibility standards in areas of built environment, education and employment. We're funding community groups and businesses to improve accessibility, creating new accessibility training for government staff and managers, and creating guides and policies around accessible meetings, events, and communication. Auditing government employee processes for accessibility barriers, and additionally, we'll be continuing to invest in our Access Includes Everyone awareness campaign to help reduce discrimination attitudes towards persons with disability. In recognition of this year's Access Awareness Week, we're also launching a new digital resource hub hosted on our Access Includes Everyone website. I'd personally like to take the opportunity to thank the Coalition of Community Organizations led by the Nova Scotia's League of Equal Opportunities who take time each year to organize a week-long series of celebrations across the province. Access Awareness Week is an opportunity to highlight for Nova Scotians the work and leaders of the disability community and to become better educated on accessibility issues. I invite you all to take part in this year's events by getting involved within your own communities and your workspaces to help support our goal of a more accessible and inclusive Nova Scotia for everyone. 
Thank you and have a wonderful week. So although Mayor Mike Savage was not able to join us this morning, I would like to thank him as well as the Honorable John, Honor, Honorable Brad Johns, sorry, um, for supporting this event, for showcasing their commitment to Access Awareness Week. It takes all of us together to work towards a more accessible and inclusive Nova Scotia. As this theme is Access Includes Everyone, Moving the Bar on Quality of Life, we would like to dedicate some time to highlight the importance of quality of life data, especially with persons with disabilities. We have two of our partners here today, Don Steegen from the Accessibility Directorate and Danny Graham, Chief Engagement Officer from Engage Nova Scotia to give their thoughts on how discussing quality of life is crucial to access and improving the lives of persons with disabilities. To start us off, I'm going to invite Don from the Accessibility Directorate to share how access includes everyone, especially with the goal to improve quality of life for persons with disabilities. Don, I have a big bio to read first. <laughs> Don Steegen joined the Accessibility Directorate uh, in June 2020 prior to Prior to joining the Accessibility Directorate and becoming the Executive Director, Dawn was with the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage, where she led initiatives and strategies related to trails, physical activities, recreation and sport, and accessibility. Prior to joining government in 2009, Dawn served for over 20 years in executive and management positions with non the nonprofit sector in Nova Scotia and Ottawa, including the Canadian Red Cross and Recreation Nova Scotia. Dawn now lives in Cumberland County, but her heart is in Cape Breton. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I appreciate the acknowledgements, all the acknowledgements given this morning. And uh, I may refer to my notes a little bit more than I used, I usually do, just because I think we're all distracted this morning because of the fires and our, our thoughts are with families and also with the first responders that are supporting our communities. I'd like to uh, just identify myself as a, I guess, a middle-aged woman with gray hair now. I'm wearing a white and brown black kind of sh uh, shirt with a bit of a design. And um, I also like to acknowledge a few of my colleagues from the Department of Justice Accessibility Directorate in the room today. I've got to take my glasses off in case others have joined us. So we have Jasmine Smarsh and uh, Justin Kent Ketty and also Associate Deputy Minister Michelle Higgins and our former Executive Di Director Jerry Post in the back. So I, if I missed anybody, I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, but great to see some members of the team and the former team with us today. Um, so we are very pleased to be part of uh, Nova Scotia's annual celebration for Access Awareness Week. And this is a time where, as, as we've, if other speakers have mentioned, we recognize the valuable contribution and leadership of Nova Scotians with disabilities. We highlight the work of people and organizations and communities in removing and preventing barriers. And we reflect on ongoing efforts to become a more accessible, inclusive Nova Scotia. And these are goals the Accessibility Directorate embraces wholeheartedly. The Directorate is around five and a half years old, and if there's one thing that's been made clear over those years is that there can be um, sort of no change without leadership and involvement of persons with disabilities in community, in organizations, uh, in government, and in our work. So the Act uh, has a purpose, the Accessibility Act, and it says achieve accessibility. And we achieve that through the prevention and removal of barriers. But it also says, and goes on to say, that we will achieve accessibility 
to will will it will improve independence and well being of persons with disabilities. So we're very excited to be uh, partnering with uh, NS Leo and other organizations on the quality of life persons with disabilities initiative. Um, it's being led by NS Leo, and uh, but many organizations will be involved with this work. It's an index that will be developed when developed will allow all of us to better monitor the progress that's happening in our province to make Nova Scotia more accessible. In addition to it being independently developed by community, this will be the first tool of its kind in North America, and it will measure improved accessibility in all its dimensions and will focus on well being of persons with disabilities. This groundwork of developing an index for Nova Scotia has been partially laid by the rich data and the work uh, through Engage Nova Scotia's 2019 Quality of Life Survey. So this index initiative will include working with disability organizations and government and other subject matter experts, and it will build on the Engage Nova Scotia work. And we will, of course, be focused on uh, the index will be specific to the lives of persons with disabilities. Our hope is the index will be a tool that we can all use to ensure that we are continually moving in the right direction and building an accessible province together. Um, so again, we're very excited to be at this um, at this table and to be a partner in this initiative. Another tool that I'd, I'd like to just mention that we're using to inform our work and our approach going forward is what we call the ACT Review Report. So as many of you would know, the report of the first independent review of the Accessibility Act was released just two weeks ago on May 17th by Dr. Katie Albrecht. Uh, Dr. Albrecht is a disability scholar and a professor at St. of X University, and she led the independent review. Close to 800 Nova Scotians um, and community organizations contributed and provided feedback. And the report provides or indicates the province is showing leadership and is making progress, but there is so much more to do and there's areas of improvement, including in the development of standards and communication and engagement. It was an important review, not of the just of the act, but of our work and of our standard development process to ensure that we're continually responsive to the needs of persons with disabilities. And the next review will get underway in 2026. So don't forget that we're always available at the Accessibility Directorate if you want to provide us with feedback or have conversation. There's over 48 recommendations and we'll be carefully reviewing those recommendations throughout this year and be providing a response and advice to government on a go forward plan. We'll be taking stock and we may be adjusting or enhancing our work as we move forward as a result of these recommendations. We also anticipate that this will be a year we'll be, where we'll be sharing a lot about the standards in the coming months. And we are, we do have a goal that all six standards will be at some stage of development by the end of this fiscal year. But there are many pathways to accessibility and standards is just one of those. This year, our focus and attention is on expanding our education, our partnership and our awareness campaign. And so we'll continue to grow the Access Includes Everyone campaign. We'll be producing more tools and resources for municipalities, businesses, sectors, to increase that understanding and awareness of accessibility. And we'll also be developing new partnerships with disability organizations and other sectors, including housing. So in closing, I invite all of you to take part in this year's events and get involved in your community and your workplace to help support a goal of the more accessible Nova Scotia. And to mark Access Awareness Week 2023, I challenge all of us, but I challenge ourselves at the directorate and our partners in government to take action and do more. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. Next, we have Danny Graham. Danny Graham is currently the Chief Engagement Officer for Engage Nova Scotia, an independent nonprofit that is leading the Nova Scotia Quality of Life Initiative with an extensive network of partners from public, private, 
academic, and community, provincially, nationally, and internationally. In 2019, almost 13,000 Nova Scotians responded to a 230 question survey administered by Engage NS in cooperation with the Canadian Index of Wellbeing. With Dalhousie University, they have developed pioneering tools to extract the findings of the survey in real time across demographics and neighborhood profiles. Partners in all three <laughs> levels of government are considering the findings of the survey and the use of the tools to catalyze, sorry, <laughs> new action, inform policy decisions, and shape the narrative about how to leave fewer Nova Scotians behind. I would like to invite Danny Graham from Engage Nova Scotia to share how quality of life data is important to provide insights for positive change. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Shelley. Um, and it's an honor for me to be here and to share some uh, thoughts from the work that we've been doing at Engage Nova Scotia. Um, maybe if I uh, just sort of offer some preparatory remarks and then I'm going to have high anxiety as I try to link into a tool that uh, is intended to show you the stories that are emerging for us uh, related to the quality of life of persons with disability uh, here in HRM. More to say about the many ways in which those tools that were mentioned uh, by Shelley are being animated across sectors and across regions of the province. Um, I'd first uh, want to um, identify myself as, uh, um, I, I used to say red hair. I'm, I'm clearly somebody who doesn't have red hair anymore. I have white hair. I'm middle-aged. I'm white. I have a blue sweater on. I go by him and he pronouns and I uh, am the son of settlers uh, from northern Nova Scotia. Uh, I'm also a father of five uh, beautiful young boys and my eldest of whom, Patrick, age 32, has been the person who has uh, slowed me down, opened my mind, and softened my heart because he both has Down syndrome and he's on the autism uh, spectrum. And uh, for 30 years now, I have been an advocate amongst so many other courageous families for persons with disabilities, and in particular for people with intellectual uh, challenges and developmental delays. So it's an honor very much for me to be here and in part to carry some of what uh, Patrick's voice is. It always means just a little bit more for me when I am standing uh, in the shoes and in a place where I'm speaking with Patrick sort of under my wing uh, as a result of my lived experience. So um just share a little bit about uh, the work that we've been doing. As Don said, we've been fortunate. Uh, our little nonprofit, uh, Engage Nova Scotia, sits at the intersection of the public, private, academic, and community sectors. We've been around for about 11 years. And our mission is to change the approach for improving quality of life for everyone. For everyone being something that increasingly we feel warrants uh, greater and increased uh, emphasis. Um, so back in 2019, uh, with the partnership of some of the organizations that are represented here today, Jerry Post will remember after the Accessibility Act was brought into place, we uh, sought out the input and advice from people who are first voice and participating in the questions and advocacy that are required for us to understand the quality of life of everyone. And so I'll just describe briefly uh, what we did in 2019 and what we hope to do in 2024. And uh, interestingly, what we also intend to do in 2029 in terms of doing measurements that will be important for uh, Nova Scotians. We administered a uh, 230 question survey um, and uh, we sent invitations to 80,000 Nova Scotia households to participate 
in this survey. 13,000 Nova Scotians, a record percentage of people. Uh, this was done 15 other times in municipalities across Canada. This was the largest uh, of its type ever done. Uh, 13,000 Nova Scotians answered those 230 questions. And approximately 25%, just above 25% of those were persons who identified as having a disability. In Halifax alone, we had over 4,000 respondents to those 230 questions. So to put that in context, Nova Scotia has the largest quality of life data set of any jurisdiction in North America. HRM has the largest quality of life data set for any municipality in North America. And what I'm about to show you is the disaggregated uh, findings from uh, the work that we've been able to do. And it's just a small slice of the many things that we have been wanting to do. And we're particularly excited to be working with the Accessibility Directorate, the Department of Justice, and other departments of government that are actually looking to level the playing field for those people in Nova Scotia who have been historically and systemically left behind for a long period of time. So um, here comes the anxious part uh, for me as I try to do a bit of a screen share. And I want to apologize in advance as we try to adjust for the uh, font size um, with cart particularly playing in the corner. Um, we've never quite uh, done it exactly this way. Uh, so I'm going to just cut to the quick with respect to uh, what we've done with this particular tool. Again, huge shout out goes to Dalhousie University's Faculty of Computer Sciences and the way that we, they have allowed us to create a mapping tool and this tool which is so exciting. We still call it Whiz Bam Boom. Um, we'll get a more mature name when I mature about my excitement uh, about this, but you'll see very quickly, and this is addressed alphabetically, we have stories of Nova Scotians broken down by many different dimensions of their lives. African Nova Scotian Nova Scotians, people by age, the stories of people in different geographic regions, the stories of people who have chronic illnesses, children, families, stories of disabilities, discrimination, um, and so on and so forth. Um, time doesn't allow for me to share with you all of the findings uh, related to this, but I'd like to give you a peek into a window that's actually consistent with a peek into the window that I gave to the residents of CBRM a couple of weeks ago when I was asked to uh, address CBRM Council in Cape Breton about the stories of people in that community that are being left behind. So for today's purposes, I'm just gonna go into a fancy term. I'm only becoming comfortable with it now, the data drawer for HRM. And you'll see very quickly that we've got lots of different, really interesting, uh, to look at the differences across urban, rural, and suburban parts of HRM. But we, we're just going to, for today's purposes, look at the stories of HRM residents on average and HRM residents who are part of that 25 to 30% who report being impacted by a disability. Um, so uh, first thing to notice here, I'm gonna go very quickly, is that we've got a lot of questions. So we're not gonna take you through all of that. You'll be relieved to see. They're organized in color codes on the left-hand side by what we call domains. This pink domain is community vitality. Then we have healthy populations, democratic engagement, environment, leisure and culture, education, living standards, which includes both your work situation and stories of poverty and affordability, and then time use uh, for people. Now that's the first thing for you to look at. I'm just giving you patterns again. I'm gonna zoom in in a moment to give you a better feel for the actual findings for HRM residents with disabilities. So lots of questions organized across the colors on the left. Now the colors on the right represent concerns if they are purple. The darker purple, the bigger the concern. And yellows are strengths and assets. Okay, so purples are concerns, darker purples are bigger concerns, yellows are strengths, and anything close to sort of the white or light colors aren't statistically important differences for people. So very quickly, you can see, and I won't go into this in great detail, the pattern where the average or the, of the 4,000, all of the 4,000 residents 
show up in the first of the two columns that you'll see, predominantly in that muted white and yellow, close to the provincial average, happy to talk about what the differences are in HRM relative to other places. On the right-hand column are the stories of concerns for people with disabilities in HRM. And you'll see, I'll just give you the big pattern around this. Look at how much more, I'm just gonna zoom in a bit. Look at the types of concerns that show up for uh, people in, who have disabilities in HRM relative to other places, or the, uh, the HRM average. Um, just gonna take you out and show you Watch how consistently those purples for people with per persons uh, with disabilities and chronic illnesses show up in HRM. Look at that. Um, issues related to, and I'll come back to the specifics about what are of those uh, concerns. Look at the, these stories right here that I'm just highlighting on the screen relate to uh, the uh, real big challenges related to work that exist for persons with disabilities in HRM, the purples on the right. The stories that show up on the right hand side here relate to whether or not persons with disabilities in HRM are able to put a roof over their head, nutritious food on the table, whether they go to food banks more often, whether they can get around our communities. So I'll just zoom in a little bit to give you a feel for some of those answers just to give you a feel for uh, these differences and you'll see right away concerns about whether or not as i zoom in whether people ate healthy meals um, whether they could purchase nutritious food whether they had food banks whether they had enough uh, money to buy the things they wanted or the things uh, that they needed and it really represents uh, significant and important concerns from our perspective. Now, you may be wondering, that's a lot of information. Can you, can you give us something that's slightly more simplified uh, in this? And uh, the answer is yes. It takes a little bit of time to do it, but we've got some fancy tools that allow you to see the most notable, statistically reliable and important notable concerns for different populations of people. So. I'm going to give you the story, first of all, of what are the assets and or concerns for the average resident in HRM compared to the provincial average. And here's what shows up. In general, there aren't significant, any significant and statistically reliable concerns for the average resident in HRM. And in fact, the assets are, they have more environmentally friendly practices, they have higher perceptions of the healthcare system, childcare is more available to them, educational opportunities are available, and they use sport and recreation facilities more often. Watch what happens when I change the, the profile from the average HRM resident to HRM residents with disabilities. Boom. While HRM residents with disabilities still engage in environmentally friendly practices, in order of concerns, they perhaps not surprisingly report having low self-assessed physical health, experiences of discrimination due to disability, low satisfaction with life generally. The, the, this is the organizing question around which well-being is often defined. And then feeling unsafe in neighborhoods, poor work-life balance, further experiences of discrimination that could be about their age or skin color or other issues, experiences of loneliness, low confidence in institutions, infrequent healthy lifestyle behaviors, low perceptions of, prom of job promotion prospects, barriers to recreation, infrequent use of sport and recreation facilities, and insecure employment. Those are all statistically reliable bits of information for us to be uh, paying attention to. This story is not unique to HRM. It's consistent, generally speaking, with what we would find in all the other regions of our province. So as we sort of take stock on this important day, uh, when we're trying to imagine, okay, what does awareness around accessibility really look like for us? It looks like an uneven playing field that have, has existed for far too long. 
And ableism, as we know, has been, is, is profoundly in our community. And it shows up in ways that we need to be increasingly vocal about and understanding the subtleties around in all of its different forms. Our commitment as a small organization is to work with NS Leo to create that index, which we hope will be groundbreaking and really allow for the kind of breakthrough that we uniquely in Nova Scotia can have and deserve to more quickly level the playing field and allow for those ramps to drop for people to actually feel like they are included. There's nothing more, um, there are the strengths in our region of uh, Canada, which by international standards are enormously significant, is that we as Maritimers actually have amongst the highest experiences of sense of belonging to community of any people in the entire world. That's something to be tremendously proud of. But that sense of belonging to community is not evenly distributed. And my hope is that through our collective efforts that we link arms and we imagine ourselves in a society where we live up to all the things that are natural strengths for us in this region, in this city, to actually build a more inclusive, equitable, resilient, and vibrant HRM in Nova Scotia. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Danny, for that presentation and Don. Um, quality of life is so important for, for everyone and especially those persons with disabilities. There are so many barriers that we face and myself working with, um, being a member of and working with the blind community, uh, a lot of the, the issues that Danny brought up resonated. Um, with me and, and thinking about the clients that I work with. And I'm really excited for this work to continue and I'm really happy to uh, hopefully be sitting at the table to, to help um, make change in the future for the quality of life of people with disabilities in Nova Scotia. All right, on to the second part of the agenda. Uh, now we are moving to celebrate the leaders in our community with the Melhab Hourglass Action Awards. And I am going to pass the mic over to Taylor Carvery, Melhab's granddaughter, to give some information about the awards and present the awards to these this year's recipients. Hi there, my name is Taylor Carvery. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a pretty tall individual, mixed individual wearing all black. Um, today, I would like to highlight my grandfather, Mel Hebb. Uh, the lives his story has touched and to continue sharing his message, or sorry, excuse me. Um, I'm here to share his story and to continue sharing his message and to remember a part of the reason why we're here today. Um, being born in the South Shore, his life consisted of helping his parents with, the, with their farm and his education. As a nine-year-old boy, Mel had caught the polio virus, which led to a long journey of physical healing and emotional recovery. This virus ha was a hard one to beat and killed a lot of the population. And when and if you survived, it deteriorated the spine and muscles and left most survivors disabled. Luckily, he survived um, and would have a lifelong changes to adjust to with only partial mobility in one of his arms and no movement below his waist. At this time, he was labeled Nova Scotia's most physically disabled person. The time he spent away from the farm was two years straight. It's hard for me to wrap my head around that amount of time being spent in hospital. This was the amount of time he spent in hospital initially recovering. This is solely the recovery from the virus too. He spent the majority of his young life in and out of the hospital. Last year, um, he may have had an impact on the school, uh, the, where I went, wanted to go to school. Uh, I only did, I went to Dow for the one year, but I did finish it. 
while I attended this university last year, it was a reoccurring thought of how, and even at this day and age, how inaccessible the campus really is. And this is this has improved since he attended. So it's really sad to kind of think about how he had to endure that. Even in his book, he touched on plenty on the idea of how he was not able to complete school without the help of others. Um, in his book, he mentioned the way he was carried up steps to exams, some of his classes, and had to rely on others for guaranteed access everywhere. Even before university, his home life was extremely reliant on his family, even to use the bathroom. His mobility limitations never put brakes on his dreams, which led to proving to others that he was capable of success and readjusted, readjusting to independence. I never personally got the privilege of meeting him, but I have my mom and many of his beloved friends and family able to tell me of how much of an amazing person who inspires and con or who inspired and continues to inspire people whom have never met him as well. From what I hear, though, I do have a female version of him in my life who is just as loud and happy as he is. Love you forever, Mom. I believe the changes that people continue to make surrounding issues of inaccessibility is due to the leadership certain disabled individuals choose to contribute. His legacy continues through his daughters and grandchildren and also the winners of the awards throughout the years. I want to thank the board for inviting us and letting me to let, thank you for letting me speak and to share his story and would love to congratulate the winners of these awards um, made a full contribution to the disabled community. Sorry, I actually not got done here. <laughs> Just me again here, guys, sorry. <laughs> okay, going on the script now. Um, no, sorry, that was my fault. The Hourglass Action Awards were launched in 1992. That year, the theme in the National Awareness Week was local community action. On one of the week's publications was the image of an hourglass. This hourglass inspired the award's name and its spirit of timely action. In 2000, the name of the awards was changed from the Hourglass Action Awards to the Mel Hab Hourglass Action Awards in honor of Mr. Mr. Melbourne Hebb. A former chair of the awards committee, the spirit of awards remains unchanged. Hebb, who passed away in October 1999, was the personification of dedica dedicated action. His dry sense of humor could have been mistaken for grumpiness, but those who knew Mel Hebb knew differently. Mel gave freely of himself. Who, he put all of himself into everything he pursued. His life was a demonstration of the type of leadership and dedication the Hourglass Awards recognize. Contracting polio in 1942 at the age of nine, Hebb's days as typical Lunenburg, Lunenburg County, country farm boy ended the disease stripped him of his ability to run, climb trees, and bathe and write. His paralysis becoming so complete that he couldn't even swat flies away from his face. But Hebb fought back with years of rehab and therapy, though he only regained 50% of normal functioning. Hebb's courage remained untouched. Hebb finished high school by correspondence in overcoming the challenges of being a wheelchair user on a campus that was often and remained less than a wheelchair friendly. Hebb completed his Bachelor of Commerce degree at Dell University. His interest in issues related to access was born both at, of a desire for an equitable society and need both of his own desire for a full life. Hebb went on to jobs at New Leaf Enterprises, Dalhousie Print Shop, and the Nova Scotia Rehab Hospital. All these positions demonstrated his work ethic and determination. 
He married Wanda, also a polio survivor, and raised two, dollars, two daughters. In 1996, he published an autobiography, Wills to Victory, an account painful at times of his struggle, struggles and their overcoming. A member of the award committee for four years, two of those chairs as chair, Mal was an inspiration to those, the others involved and to all persons. He passed away October 3rd, 1999. The following spring, the awards were renamed in his honor. I think that's all I have from this part. For me. Okay. Well, I don't really have the names of the recipients. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, totally. Okay. We made it here at the end. Thank you everyone for your patience. We're just going to do a yet another pivot and I will actually read out the bios for those who will be receiving uh, Melhab awards today and Taylor will present them. Thank you so much for your patience. The first award that we are presenting will be the Encore Award that will be going to recognize a person with a disability who has significantly contributed to the community. And there are two recipients for this year's award. The first being a local hero, Kendall Worth. Kendall, would you like to come up and accept your award? Our second recipient of the Encore Award is John Smith. Thank you. 
As you can tell, it's been a while since we have done live events. Uh, so we're just going to, to roll with it. So again, we do appreciate your patience with this. Our next award is the Exceptional Service Award. Um, the committee actually uh, was very quick in recognizing this person's contributions, which goes to recognize an organization or a member of an organization that has gone beyond their mandate in service to persons with disabilities. And this year, we are presenting the Exceptional Service Award to Joanne Bernard, CEO and President of Easter Seals, Nova Scotia. The next award is being presented is the Access Award, which is to recognize an individual, business, or a group without a mandate to serve persons with disabilities that has worked to improve access to facilities or services in a given area. While changes made to a building specifically to improve accessibility are eligible, we regret that there are improvements that are made that are mandated by the building code cannot be considered. This year, we are presenting the Access Award to Clifford Emberley, owner of Para Bistro, who unfortunately, because of uh, the fires, is unable to travel in today. So we will be sending this to him to ensure that he gets it. Thank you. The next award, Community Action Award, which recognizes communities and municipalities dedicated to increasing opportunities for persons with disabilities in their area. This includes recreation opportunities, inclusive education, and employment opportunities that lead to the full participation of persons with disabilities. And this year, we are pleased to be presenting the Community Action Award to the Region of Queen's Municipality. You sure can. Good morning. My name is Darlene Norman, and I'm pleased to be the mayor of the Region of Queen's. I identify today as a middle-aged woman with light gray hair, glasses, medium built. I would like to express our sincere thank you to the provincial government who in 2018 implemented this very, very important act. The, government, the Council of the Region of Queens in 2019 immediately jumped on board and invested in excellent full-time staff, Elise Johnston, who, because of the financial resources that the province continues to provide, we were able to use. So thank you. It's very important to create level playing fields across our province. And I would like to accept this award with Elise, who is our wonderful, dedicated, committed individual who brings to us her great ideas and we always support her. So Elise, yes, that's you with your big wide eyes. <laughs> if you would come and please accept this award with me. I seem to have forgotten to invite those who received the awards to come up and say a few words. So <laughs> I noticed Joanne is snickering over there. 
I'm going to present the last award, and then I'm going to invite recipients in order to come up and say a few words. The last award that we will be presenting is the Andre McConnell Award, which is to recognize an individual who has gone above and beyond their duties as a provincial, municipal, or federal public servant, and has demonstrated, one, a commitment to person-centered service, always putting the needs and concerns of persons with disabilities first, and two, true dedication to supporting persons with disabilities to fully participate in their communities. This year, we are presenting the Andre McConnell Award to Robert Seely, which will be accepted by Katie MacArthur on his behalf. I will now invite Kendall. Would you like to say a few words? I know you have to run. Yes. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, yes, I do have to be out of here in a few minutes. I want to thank the award like organizers for um, cooperating with my time that I'm available to be here would be able to stay longer if it wasn't a wildfire, but still would have to be out of here by 11. But anyway, I just want to let people know that if you want to find out a bit more about who I am and about my activism in that, I used to write up until the passing of Robert DeBay, who I'm sure some of you in this audience, if not most or all of you, has been familiar with in the past. Um, I used to write for the Nova Scotia Advocate until that ceased to exist due to his passing a couple of years ago. And now I have my own blog, w-o-r-t-h-m-a-t-t-e-r-s.blogspot.com. That's where you'll find my blog. But anyway, I just want to thank you for the award and thank um, the contact I have in the community who um, who nominated me for this award and um, I'm just glad that my um, activism is being recognized once again this is not the first award that I have won like since I started advocating for people living in poverty and my advocacy does include persons with disabilities both physical and mental disabilities invisible and non-invisible disabilities and um, I advocate a lot for things like basic guaranteed income. You could even say, like to some extent, I was one of the early advocates in getting the current Bill C-22, which is being passed in Parliament and worked on. Um, I was one of the early advocates to get that going. And um, I'm a person with a disability myself. Um, I've had learning disabilities my whole life and OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. But I, you know, I consider myself deserving and I do a lot to contribute, so I just want to thank you. Thank you so much, Kendall. John, would you like to come up and say a few words? Mike is hot. <laughs> so hopefully the wheelchair doesn't attract uh, itself. Um, first, I'd like to thank Pants and the uh, Nalhia family um, for this award. Uh, it's a great honor. I'd like to thank my nominator, Jane Reed, uh, for great to bring this forward for me. Uh, I'd also like to thank my uh, family for, I guess, uh, allowing me to volunteer as much as I do and my wife, who has been very patient with you over the years. Uh, it's very important to volunteer. It's been 32 years now I've been in a wheelchair, and every day I've enjoyed volunteering, meeting new people, 
Um, and the value that you give back to the community in education, that everyone has value. So I think that's something to keep in mind. So uh, thank you all. Thank you all for, for coming. Joanne, would you like to come up and say a few words? Thank you. I would like to thank the Melhebs family. I've read the book. It's fascinating. Um, I'd like to thank um, the committee for, for uh, endorsing my nomination. Um, I, I sort of uh, fell into the uh, um, disability community in a way that uh, led me on the path where I am right now. So uh, I was the minister responsible for the, the Accessibility Act, Bill 59, um, and then worked with lots of disability persons uh, and organizations through that process, learned so much. Um, and my background had been mostly with the women's community and, and domestic violence. And then uh, in 2017, uh, moved into Easter Seals, Nova Scotia, and have been a fierce advocate with my friend Sherry and many other uh, leaders in the disability community. Um, we were able, a couple of years ago, to look at the intersectionality between domestic violence and women with disabilities, and were able to produce a report that thankfully all recommendations were accepted so uh, it's really nice to be able to still affect policy within this province um, uh, I wish that I was in a position to still affect it uh, because all children deserve to be in school all children if not all children can go to school then no children should be in school um, that's the way it's been in other provinces, and that's the way it should be here. Uh, so hopefully there will be a resolution to this. And I do know that there are families affected by this um, fire that have lost a house. And now this young fella has no school, no classroom, no home. So please keep that in mind when uh, thinking about uh, the wildfires and thinking about this ongoing labor dispute. Thank you. Just want to make sure that I don't miss anybody. <laughs> so Cliff is not able to attend. Um, Katie, would you like to come up and say a few words? Hi, thank you. I just uh, very quickly wanted to pass on um, Robert's deep gratitude and thanks for the award. He, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, but I was happy to come and accept on his behalf. Um, Robert would, I would be remiss if I didn't say that Robert would credit all of the work that's been done at the Village of Greenwood to the support that he has from the Village Commission and, and the county. Um, and so would definitely say that he is not doing this alone. Um, so thank you very much. Before I relinquish the mic, for closing from our esteemed MC Shelley, I would like to give a uh, thank you to Dawn and to Danny for carving out time to come in today and to speak so much about the quality of life and to lay some, some more foundational work on what's being done. So we truly do appreciate that. Uh, I'd also like to take this moment to thank Taylor. Uh, we do have a little something for you, Taylor. <laughs> if you'd like to come up and accept it. Again, thank you. Taylor has just graduated and uh, first full-time job. 
And Shelly, I do have a little something for you as well. I would like to thank you for all of your work in emceeing and for pivoting again and again. <laughs> and I have an envelope here for you. There you go. And I'll give the mic back to Shelly. <laughs> Thank yous all around. So just wanted to thank Sherry and Taylor for uh, passing out the awards and uh, pivoting. And thank you all for your patience. And um, I also want to just congratulate all the reward, award recipients um, and their contributions to the community and the inclusion of persons with disabilities. This was a great way to start off Accessibility Awareness Week. And I'd love to also thanks, thank on behalf of the PANS Committee, uh, Minister Johns for his Access Awareness Week message. Um, and also Don and Danny for showing how important it is to talk about quality of life. All our award recipients and their supporters for the contribution to the community um, and all of you for being here. Thank you so much for supporting PANS, supporting this event, and um, hopefully you're able to participate in many events this week for Access Awareness Week. Thank you so much, and have a great day.